Ingui, we still uh, are recommending 12 nets per commercial fisherman. Net buoys, I mentioned earlier that this was, uh, this was in the law that was passed that all nets must be properly buoyed. We have a regulation in place now that says they, um, they have to be four inches by six inches. And that's a, that's, that's a decent recommendation, but we, we thought we'd be more specific and use these, a bullet float, which is a five inch diameter and a length of 11 inches. And these bullet floats are standard. They're acceptable. A lot of fishermen already use them. Uh, they would be recognized easily by, by people. We could put signs at the boat ramps saying these, uh, be, on, be aware that these are uh, buoy nets used legally by commercial fishermen in open waters and uh, maybe put a little warning on there about uh, that they can't take them or they can't destroy them or anything like that, but it's against the law. So we could post that and, and that way fishermen and anglers would be aware of them too. Maybe they uh, be a little more uh, cognizant of them. After the, the advisory committee meeting, uh, this is still our recommendation, no change. The length limit is 36 inches, as I mentioned earlier. We recommended to go to 38 inches, which is, as you recall, was uh, what we've been trying to get to for over 10 years. At least uh, it was initially recommended. Um, after the meeting, we, we still are, are recommending going to 38 inches. And that's, again, from the, the front of the eye to the fork and the tail. Um, onboard processing, currently um, commercial paddle fishers are allowed to screen the eggs while on the water. Now screening is a process where they, they take the ovaries from a paddle fish and they'll, they'll rub up across the screen and all the, the eggs will go th through the bottom of the screen but the connective tissue and fatty tissue and all that will, will not be part of it, it'll, it'll stay out of it and they can throw that part away. And so they end up with a bucket full of, of eggs that are processed. Our regulation uh, currently states that they also have to keep a, uh, if they catch a legal paddlefish, 36 inches or bigger, they have to keep a two inch portion of the ovary inside the paddlefish on the boat and the eggs have to be kept in separate containers. The, the issue is that because they can screen these eggs on board, uh, they could potentially take uh, the eggs from an undersized paddlefish, screen them and mix them in it with eggs from a, a legal ta legally taken paddlefish, and there's no way to to be able to tell if, if those were uh, taken from a smaller fish or not. It's it's not an enforceable regulation. We've been trying to get this, rid of this one for a long time too. Um, so we our initial proposal was that paddlefish must be kept whole until sold to a licensed wholesale fish dealer or process at an approved HACCP facility, and HACCP is uh, something that we don't enforce, but it's enforced by the Department of Agriculture. And there are various facilities scattered across the state that allow people to go in and, and use for processing uh, fish or, or other animals if they want to. We, at the advisory committee meeting, we, we brought this up. Um, I will say that they were not in favor of this regulation. And when we, when we asked for some ideas or suggestions, uh, we didn't get any, and we threw a few out. And at that meeting, uh, we, we still did not come up with a, any kind of solution or, or compromise or anything. Uh, so we just left it the way it was. Now since that meeting, well, let me mention this too. I, you've seen this slide before, and of the eight states that are open to commercial harvest of paddlefish, uh, Tennessee is the only state that allows this processing on the water, just, just for your information. So since the meeting, uh, understanding that it can be a hardship to some of the uh, wholesale fish dealers who buy fish that may be caught in East Tennessee, they may have their facility in West Tennessee, uh, we're willing to throw a compromise out for consideration. And this compromise would be that paddlefish must remain whole and intact while on the water. Eggs may not be removed outside of fish's body cavity while on the water or the immediate adjacent, adjacent bank. Eggs can only be removed at the boat ramp or boat ramp parking area or, or processing facility. No processed paddlefish and or eggs can be processed while on the water. Excuse me, no processed paddlefish can be in possession while on the water. 
blocking of paddlefish would not be permitted, obviously. All row harvesters and helpers can only launch and take out from designated boat ramps, and that will be determined later. So if you put in at a, a designated boat ramp, you have to take out from that same boat ramp, and that's, that's for uh, being able to better enforce regulation. So in summary, because of our concern over the serious decline of paddlefish harvest across the state over the last eight years, and a 91% decrease on Kentucky Lake, which is where the study was done that I mentioned, and uh, also as a result of recommendations that came from uh, the 2002 study as well, the 2005 Tennessee Tech study, which recommended reducing the number of commercial fishermen, reducing the season length, increasing the minimum length limit, reducing mortality, the discard mortality. Uh, those are the recommendations that we're bringing forward today. And as a side note, um, which is not really one of the reasons we're going forward with this, but if those regulations are in place, as we're proposing them, we've got verbal approval from the Fish and Wildlife Service that they would approve the export of paddlefish eggs out of Tennessee. And, and as the commercial, uh, the commercial fishermen will tell you, uh, they will get probably more money for eggs that are exported as opposed to those that are sold dom domestically. So uh, I guess the message would be to, uh, in order to think globally, act locally. So that's all I've got. A very short presentation. You Any questions from you the- consider that was short? <laughs> yeah. Now I appreciate you educating us. Uh, obviously uh, we, uh, uh, there's a lot of information to consume, but I appreciate you putting that together. What questions do we have from the commission first? Yes, sir, Tom. The, uh, the number of pounds, was that the pounds of fish or pounds of eggs? I'm sorry, the number of pounds, yes, the number of pounds, it was the number of pounds of eggs that I was showing for the harvest, yeah. The 20,000, over 20,000 pounds in 2006 was 20,000 pounds of eggs from Kentucky Lake. This past year, in 2014, it was less than 2,000, like 1,900, I think. Facilities you spoke of to, to take the fish to uh, how many of there and, and where are they? In other words, is, would a person have to ship a fish from East Tennessee to West Tennessee? Well, not necessarily. There, there's uh, Eric probably knows more because someone from the Department of Agriculture contacted Eric. Uh, he didn't make the initial contact. They contacted him, uh, and in their discussion, that we found out that. There are approved HACCP facilities that are available to the public. I'm not, there's probably a charge for using them. I don't know, but, but there, I know there's some in Clarksville. Yeah, Eric, you wanna? There's not really a whole lot of them. Though. No, I don't think there's a whole lot of them, but I, let well, Eric, he might be able to answer that. Can you that describe question. what constitutes the facility too, please? Um, again, these are, again, my name is Eric Gaines. I'm the commercial fishing biologist for the state. Um, as Bobby had uh, mentioned, I had been contacted by the Department of Agriculture on our agricultural campus, um, and they had just wanted general information about um, um, processing of, of all uh, catfish, uh, not only paddlefish, so they just kind of wanted a brief overview. At that time, he had, he had uh, given me information that we had, or the state actually has HACCP approved facilities. Uh, I believe there's one in Clarksville. Uh, there's one in uh, uh, Chattanooga. Uh, I think there's a private one that uh, people can go into in Nashville. Um, there's a, a small nominal charge. I think it's 10 or $20 an hour, or it's like $50 a day that you could process uh, the eggs at those facilities. I don't have an exact number on those, but I will have that uh, by the September meeting or for you. What did you say constitutes one? I mean, they're just if they're doing it in the boat, I mean, I'm, I'm not familiar with what the difference between doing it there and, and the, the approved facility. What What is that just place to clean the fish and there's appropriate refrigeration or what is it? Well, the HACCP, the HACCP plan is not just being able to take it into a, uh, a block building, as it, as it were. You can have an, a HACCP approved plan to dress those fish in your boat as long as it's been approved by uh, FDA and part of your HACCP package. I couldn't. I couldn't really answer that question very well. You know, we, we 
Commissioner Rice, I don't, we don't know that. As biologists, we don't get that information. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's the paddlefish uh, endangered, threatened? Is it, is it listed on any list as something? It's listed as a, uh, it's not listed as in, endangered in Tennessee, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bobby, we're basing a lot of this off of uh, the Tennessee Tech study that was done. Right. Has any other states or any of them done any more studies? And, you know, how do they compare with that, or if they've had any more? Right. Well, uh, let me mention a little bit more about the Tech study. There were several papers were produced as a result of that, uh, and they've been published in scientific journals and the, the journal the, um, um, that, that have been peer-reviewed by scientists across this country and accept it as, as valid science. So I, I should have mentioned that earlier, but um, the, Arkansas has done a couple of studies within their state. There's not been a, I don't think there's been any university type studies as extensive as the Tennessee Tech study, but the, the surrounding states, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas, and Kentucky have all used the results, uh, at least part of the results of the, of the Tennessee Tech study to help set their regulations and manage their paddlefish populations. Well, are the, can you explain to me what the length regulations are in the other states that are uh, surrounding Tennessee? Yeah, they, they vary. Um, none of them are, they're different in just about every state, but uh, Mississippi and part of their waters, they have a 37 inch length limit. Um, and Kentucky, on Kentucky has, on Kentucky Lake and Lake Barkley have a 38 inch length limit, which is where we're trying to go. Those are waters that, that we join. And, um, uh, Alabama's got a little bit different regulation than some of their waters, but their waters are uh, more riverine. They have a lower length limit in, uh, in the waters that they've opened, and it's a very limited fishery. It's not like ours, which is open for a long time. There's just sort of like a two-week season specific for just a few fishermen. But yet all of their, uh, these states are approved for CITES? They are. So the federal fishing game are... Right. I, I, the, the main reason that <clears throat> the Fish and Wildlife Service has, uh, for Tennessee is, is declined the export is because they, paid, they have the study that they paid for by Tennessee Tech, which has specific recommendations. We're going to 38 inches and the season uh, closure and that kind of thing. And when we, uh, when the state, when TWA or the state of Tennessee deviated from that plan that they had accepted back in 2005, uh, and it's still with no intent to go to those regulations, which is 38 inches. They they uh, they denied the export permits as a result of that. Commissioner Cannon, did, oh, I'm sorry. First, and I'd like to ask okay, that. Commissioner Cox, please. Um, for clarification, Bobby, when you say they can may screen at a boat ramp. Um, you're going to designate boat ramps on every body of water that they can use and what they can't use? Right. There'll be public boat ramps. And there's a lot of them. And we'll work with the commercial fishermen to determine these ramps. Well, I'm thinking about the logistics of having, I don't know, I mean, these are big fish, so of having 20 fish in the boat and trying to run the rest of their nets and still have to dry, have to, go 20 miles to a boat ramp to, to process and go back. I don't, I'm, I'm concerned about, I understand why you're proposing that, but I'm concerned about a long run and, and the logistics of a fisherman trying to check his 12 nets. So there's not a question there. I'm just, for clarification, that's what you're talking about. Yes. And, and I should mention too that the, the compromise that, I, that we had up there is uh, almost word for word the exact uh, regulations that the state of Alabama has for their requirement for uh, handling the paddlefish. They, they also have designated ramps. They, everything else that I mentioned up there, we took it out of their regulation and put it on ours. It's Do we have a, a requirement that the fishermen must check the nets at a certain period of time? That'd be checked every 24 hours, every 24 hours. Is it legal for them to take the row and then throw the fish into water? 
You mean after they process after the they eggs take on the bank? After they take the eggs, can they discard the fish, just throw it away? They're not supposed to. Well, that's, it's, that's the law, though, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not. Okay. Right. And that's a, that's a concern that we have about uh, the, even the compromise, and I think it's a concern that some of the commercial fishermen have. If they, they get on the boat ramps or the access area and they process the fish, they're concerned that the sport fishermen might complain because of the dead fish. But, but actually, uh, we could regulate this or, or try to see if they would just do it on their own, be responsible for hauling the remains away to some, uh, to some other site, to a dumpster or something somewhere, but not leave them on, in the parking lot or leave them in trash cans in the parking lot or anything like that. And I think, I thought that Alabama had required that, but I, I haven't been able to find it in their regulation, so. Are you talking about uh, for rest? Oh, I, I couldn't tell you. I don't, I don't keep up with the enforcement parts of that. Oh, okay, okay. Ed, can we find that out? Okay, thank you. Commissioner Cannon? Bobby, three questions real quick. The, the Tennessee Tech study, it's been referred to as, I've forgotten the name of it. The Batoli study. Thank you. <laughs> the, thank you named after the professor, Dr. Phil right. Batoli. All right. <clears throat> Could you go back to your compromise slide for just a second? Sure. Just two brief questions. Okay. Uh, hang on a second. That's all right. I can ask them. I just well, I don't like it. Hang on a second. Yeah, here we go. Here it is. All right. Um, Currently, blocking of paddlefish is permitted. Is that correct? Yes, it is. it is. It is today, right. And what you're not wanting to do is process. We're trying to keep them from processing the paddlefish and the eggs on the boat. Correct. How does blocking affect that? Well, Why wouldn't we allow them to continue to block? No, because we have, the first one says they must remain whole and intact while on the water. So actually, the by that statement on the first line, it, it eliminates the ability to block the paddlefish anyway. We Let, just were specifying. Let's just stay away from the first line for just a second. Okay. We want them to keep them whole with respect to the eggs. No, no, whole with respect to the entire paddlefish. I understand. Okay. But the, in, yes, and the, eggs the too. intent has to do with keeping the eggs Correct. in the fish. Correct, right. And if they're allowed to block that fish, the eggs would still stay in. Is that where they, where I saw you had the cut line, and I'm I'm dumb as dirt uh, on this. So they would, they could. I don't know, Eric. Tell me, could they? They would stay in. Um, they would they fall. They would out? come out where the blocking occurs. Okay, I'm, through the I'm head, getting, through the I'm head learning maybe. here, so forgive me. Yeah. Um, we've said that they can process at a hasip, 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 hazardous. It's, well, we'll no, it, I I'm guess, not going to get into it. But I just heard that that, that HACCP plan can be for a specific boat. Correct. Are we saying that if a, if a boat has that plan, that they would not be allowed to process that on the water anyway? No, we're, we don't enforce the HACCP regulations at all. We would just mention that uh, just as an informational item. We, we don't enforce HACCP regulations. That's the FDA. But under this compromise, even if that boat had a has a plant on their boat, they would not be allowed to process the fish. Not on the water. Okay, thank you. Bobby, I mean, when I look and I read between the lines there, and the other states are not allowing processing of the eggs on the water, and, and we have been and now we don't want to, obviously there must be because it's, there's some individuals that are maybe taking fish that are less than our, the recommended length or is there somebody from law enforcement here that can indicate that, that there's been problems with that? I hope so. Uh, well, uh, Freddie Couch is uh, the commercial fishing uh, enforcement officer, in, initially with the commercial muscling enforcement officer, but you do a little bit of both now, and, and if, if it'd be, he would probably be able to speak better for uh, the enforcement you, part of Can you address the commission on what your findings have been or what you've seen in the past? Well, initially, when the, 
we realized there was a problem as far as checking the eggs in the fishermen's buckets while they were out in the water. We would notice that there was multiple colored eggs in the in the in their bucket. Each <clears throat> each two ovaries is uh, the result of their screenings are supposed to be <clears throat> kept in a bucket. You know that one bucket per fish, and then the body is supposed to be kept. But the multicolored from everything that we've seen in all the the samples that Eric has taken and other agency employees and every every egg that I've ever seen, they've all been the same color. So I investigated or asked uh, Mike Stockdale, who's our forensics um, person, and he looked into it and there was no DNA, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> there was no DNA data anywhere, um, it just wasn't there, it wasn't available uh, to even tell. I think uh, Eric might know as far as uh, even a male in the flesh, whether it was a male or female. So you couldn't, you could see and, and tell that they, or think that they were from a different fish or multiple fish there, but I actually had no way of proving it. So uh, in our in law enforcement's opinion, it's a, it's a problem and it needs, and, and I've, I've been suggesting them bringing them off hold for probably 10 years. Is there any questions for him before he's allowed to sit down? All right, thank you very much. Bobby. Have other questions for Bobby? Con? Uh, Bobby, did you did you say that we're the only state of the twelve that are the not eight. allowed to export? Of the eight. Eight. That, yes. that are not allowed to export. That's correct. Now we are allowed to export uh, uh, eggs from paddlefish that are caught in the Mississippi River, but the inland waters like Kentucky Lake, they're not allowed to export eggs from uh, from those waters. And do they have most of the other states have the same amount of ramps, access to the those kind of ramps that does it seem oh, to be a hardship on those? No, fish? I don't think so. And then the facilities you're talking about, like ones in Clarksville and Nashville, when they catch fish or have the, is there a certain amount of hours or time you need to get to that facility? Do you have to keep them on ice? Is that a big deal? No, I'm, it, I'm sure. Now, most of the time, keep in mind that the paddlefish season is in the colder months of year but they do I'm sure they keep them on ice even though after they screen them I'm pretty sure they keep them on ice I, I don't know that but I think they do okay. they do, uh, excuse me Commissioner King they do that now anyway they have to keep them cold is there any other questions from the Commission for Bobby I got one more quick one. Do, do your graph of showing the, the decreased and the and the harvest rate it can it could be, and I'm not saying it is, and I know it's decreased, but the, the, the days fishing, I know we've had some floods and they can't fish and that kind of thing. Have you, even with that factored, I mean, it's still on a, on a pretty hard decline. Right. I, we acknowledge that there are, uh, the last couple of years have been high water years during part of their season, but even during times when, um, when they were allowed to get out on the water, they weren't, a lot of the commercial fishermen reported to us that they weren't catching fish like they used to. They just weren't there. Certain, uh, uh, later times of the year when they typically would catch them, they weren't catching them then. All right, the closing date is because of the water temperature and the mortality rate. Right. Then the Mississippi River stays cooler longer. Correct. And if the Mississippi River, and I'll put you on the spot, if the Mississippi River and you're going to check, I suppose, I ask you to. So you'll check the temperatures now on the river. Tennessee waters on the Mississippi River from the core or wherever you get it. If those temperatures average in April or the end of April or the 21st of April are still 54 degrees, would you consider lengthening the season in the Mississippi River? And if not, why not? Well, And the, and the reason I ask is because if they cut them, if we cut them off April the seventh, or even April the first, if that's the goal, then increasing the fishing on the Mississippi River might give them a place to go. If if you know it's fifty five or fifty six or forty four degrees through the end of the month, even right. Well, yeah, we could consider that, but let, I guess I should probably say you know we you probably saw several times I would say except for the Mississippi River, except for the Mississippi River, we're. I didn't really, I purposely avoided talking about um, 
another part of the Mississippi River as far as the management goes. Just I didn't want to cloud the issue with all the other waters that we're working on, but um, there, there's been some concern over uh, paddlefish within the United States and how they're managed and that the fact that every <clears throat> a lot of the states have different regulations and, and the CITES and the European Union and other countries wonder why we have all these different regulations just because they're a state and that the paddlefish should be managed not as necessarily a state but as a, uh, a drainage area, for example. And so um, there was a, a report that came out back in December and January, an extensive report that looked at paddlefish uh, populations and, and various parameters that should be looked at. And without going into all that, I just know that we've met twice, uh, at not just Tennessee, but other states that allow commercial and sport fishing for paddlefish to look at um, trying to manage these systems as a unit and not as a state. For example, the so they divided up in several different drainages. They have the lower Mississippi River uh, area that it should be managed the same because some paddlefish from Tennessee may swim over to Arkansas in a minute. You know, they just they join each other. And the same with the, Miss, uh, the state of Mississippi as well. And then there's the upper Mississippi River, there's the Ohio River, there's the Tennessee River, the Cumberland River, the Mobile River Basin, Missouri River. All those are have been have been separated into a management unit, and the uh, we're we're looking into uh, coming up with some some way to manage those units like the Lower Mississippi River where the regulations are consistent. Um, so one of the things that we're going to be doing, I meant I showed you the slide of the of the uh, paddlefish jawbone section, is we're going to be looking at uh, aging and collecting about 300 paddlefish per unit over the next two years to try to get the, the information together on Asian growth, which will give us some more information about the, the, the kind of the status of the paddlefish, their, their longevity, how many uh, are there, um, growth rates and maturation and things like that. So we're gonna be doing that uh, as part of that group. Tennessee is part of it and all the other states that you saw up there, all the other seven states are, are part of that too. We're all gonna be pitching in and collecting some. We, we're joining with Kentucky to get some information so at, we don't want to make a change in the lower Mississippi River at this time, uh, something that might change two years down the road. And so you might ask, why are we doing that in inland waters in Kentucky Lake? Well, the, because of the steep decline in a harvest, that's the reason we got to make a change now. We're so concerned about the, paddlefish, the status of the paddlefish in, in the inland waters of Tennessee that we feel like we've got to do something now. We've been wanting to do it. Eric came to me. Uh, back in December of 2012 and said, we've got to have an emergency closure of paddlefish now. And, and I said, well, we can't do that now. We, we got to go forward. And so, and for other reasons, political reasons or whatever, we decided not to make a change then. But uh, not that it's politically much better now, but we've got to go forward. If we don't do something now, things could be a whole lot worse down the road for the paddlefish. Thank you, Bobby. Um, if there's no other questions, if you would just sit, stay to the front seat there. I know you want to sit down and I'm get good. you some water or whatever, but I, we, I we're going to ask for the public comment that they'll obviously address the questions to us, but if we need to, to refer to you, we'd just like to have you available if that's okay. At this time, uh, we'll ask for the public uh, that wants to trip. Yes, sir, if you'd be first if you state your name. Uh, my name's Mike Kelly. I've addressed you before, but for just kind of a reminder, um, 39 years in the commercial fishing industry, uh, 35 of those years has been paddle fish. And <clears throat> Chairman, I'd ask you uh, before we get started to bring back the picture of the boat full of fish, the big boat that had all the fish in it. I'd like to, I'd like to show you what you didn't see in that picture, uh, if you will. Uh, I want to talk to you. The first, the first comment I want to make is this. Part of the reason we're down this road with the legal issues and all of that is exactly what's going on now. Uh, the agency spends all this time gathering all this stuff to present it to look in favor of what they want. And then we come in a meeting and see all that and in five minutes, we're supposed to defend all that information. So 
you're getting about 10% of a 100% story. So there needs to be uh, some kind of way from this day forward where all these folks and these other caviar companies and all the information they've got, their reports and their responses back from fish and wildlife of why they can't get a permit. You all might be interested to read this gentleman's report as for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife telling him why he can't get his permit. And so we've got five carloads of information that there's no way possible that you can interpret and study all that in this type of setting. So what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit of stuff because I know you're getting tired. I've been to this thing for 15 years. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit of stuff here. Go back to the other picture, if you would, the one with a real long boat. Uh, if you don't was that mind. The, do you remember if that was at the beginning of the presentation? Uh, I, I know which one it was. It, okay. was, a, it was about a 24-foot boat uh, full of fish and had another boat to the side of it. It was uh, somebody who fishes for me, and I recognized it. All right. I'll try to find it here. I don't have but 86 slides, so it's going <laughs> to... kind of get you prepared to look at it. When Tennessee Tech that, started, uh, that no, that's it? not it. When Tennessee Tech started their study, that's it right there, hole right there. Okay. I'll show you what you didn't see here. Look over to the left at this fisher person in the, in the, don't look at the boat, there you go. Look to the left here and you'll see this nice lady with a ponytail that's fishing. She's a second generation commercial fisherman. She's in her 50s. Uh, I believe that this is Tennessee Tech's boat here, and she worked for them for a little while because they didn't know how to catch the fish. Tennessee Tech came to Kentucky Lake, and they began fishing, and they'd catch three or four a day, and they were writing up the report, it's a disaster, they're, they're about to be extinct, and, and at that time, Region 1's management uh, didn't feel like they was extinct, and and, and they wanted to get some fishermen involved because Tennessee Tech sent two college students to Kentucky Lake to do the fishing. And when our fishing people got involved, and this lady here currently is one of the hardest working women in the United States, commercial fishes, and her daddy was a commercial fisherman, and she knew how to catch them. And, and now I'd like you to look in Tennessee Tech's boat after we got involved. So uh, another thing on their report was the, the, the water temperature and the mortality rate, but what you don't see behind that story is Tennessee Tech's high, uh, college boys wouldn't show up sometimes till 12 o'clock. <coughs> and they'd pull the nets and, uh, you know, the water warms on up after the nets has been out a while. So we don't, you know, there's a lot of things in this story that you can't get in an in a hour's <laughs> presentation of a, of a commission meeting. My number one objection is, you, is we don't have an avenue to get all the information that these men have got. That's number one. Now, now I want to speak to you about the One of these guys said something about the quality a while ago. <clears throat> uh, by the way, the Catholi report stated that the Halifish population is not in jeopardy. And we're talking about a species today, and we're not talking about <coughs> I accept it as a blessing from the Lord. I swear I accept this, but in 2001, the Wall Street Journal did an article uh, on my caviar company, and I'd ask you to look at the first paragraph, you would. It says, the world's greatest caviars, uh, beluga from Russia, Ocetra from Iran, and of course, Kelly's Catch from Tennessee. 
Now, I want to give you a big country idea. We need, a light, we need to lighten up a little bit right now, so I'm going to lighten us up. I want to give you a big country idea after I got after, after this. Uh, after the Wall Street Journal come out, I decided about six months later to call them and put me an ad in the paper and say, man, do you remember me? And uh, this lady realized that I was way over my head, and uh, she said, sir, I need to send you a uh, advertising package. And uh, big country fish man in Savannah, Tennessee gets that, and it's $38,000 for a quarter page for one day. <laughs> So that you can see what this was worth to have this to happen. I want you to look right at the bottom of the middle section of this, if you would. And it says, uh, the last paragraph, our testers were savvy enough to give middle remarks on three selections of caviar. And it says two of them were paddlefish varieties. So this was a blind taste test of caviar from across the country and three paddlefish companies happened to be in this, mine being one of them. And it says that uh, Seattle Caviar Company and Shuckman's Fish Company, now go right up to the top of the next paragraph here, it says they were too mushy. And it says the third, the hackleback variety was too soft. These folks are forced to haul it around in the boat. And these fish are deteriorating, and that's what makes it mushy, because the eggs bust, because you've had to haul it around in the fish. Now I want you to look at the bottom, if you will, right, right here, guys, next to the outside here, and it says, I'm, I'm on the next to the last paragraph, it says that, uh, at the, at, but at the end, the real talk of the party uh, was a evenly plumped, nice gray colored egg that held together nice, and it seemed to be the freshest of the pig. 